Hello, welcome to this lesson in engineering mechanics and statics. We're going to talk in this lesson about the dot product, but we're going to focus on really talking about uh, cases in which the dot product is very useful. It's actually used in lots of areas in science and math. If you've uh, taken a physics course, you've probably seen the dot product uh, in terms of the definition of work, force dotted with distance, right? So that's kind of the physics realm. Here in mechanics, we're talking about force vectors and eventually we'll be talking about moments and other things. We want to know under what circumstances we really want to use a dot product for something. And there's, there's lots of different answers to that, but the, the, the big ones that come to mind, the ones that you're going to come to time and again, uh, cases in which case you might use a dot product is one case would be to find uh, the angle theta between two vectors, right? So maybe you have you know, a rope going here, pulling with some force, and a rope going here, pulling with some force, and you have some information, and what you're really seeking to figure out is what is the angle uh, there between these two vectors. Well, you can use the dot product to figure that out because of the definition of the dot product, A dot B, is a magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. So if I solve and divide this guy over here, then what I'm going to get is the cosine of the angle theta is A dotted with B divided by the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. And so then finally, I can say, well, let's do, do it this way, the angle theta between these two vectors is the inverse cosine of what I've just written down here, A dot B of magnitude A on the bottom, magnitude of B on the bottom. So basically, if you have two vectors, and you know their magnitudes, because you can calculate that, and you can figure out the dot product, which we've figured out how to calculate already, um, if you do this division here, and then you take the inverse cosine, you're going to get a number back, which is going to be the number of degrees, or radians, whatever mode you're in, between these two vectors. That's very useful. It just depends on what you're given in your problem. You know, if you have everything, to get everything on the right-hand side, then you can do that. If you don't, then you may have to use other methods. The other thing I want to tell you, just as kind of a note, something that's obvious from this, but you may not totally see it at first. Um, I'll just put it down here, note. If the dot product between these two vectors is zero, in other words, when you're trying to calculate this and you get a dot b and you get zero, then what's going to happen is, the angle that you return back is going to be 90 degrees between the vectors. That's very consistent with everything we've said. If you were to get a dot product of zero, then you would have a zero on top divided by anything gives you a zero. Inverse cosine of zero is 90 degrees. So if you get an A dot B back of zero, you're going to return 90 degrees, which is exactly what I've basically been saying before. If you have two vectors that have a 90 degree angle between them like this, then the dot product between them is zero. There's no projection of one vector onto another if they're at 90 degrees. We've been saying that over and over. So we're kind of going backwards here. We're saying, hey, if you get a dot product of zero when you're trying to calculate this, you're always going to return an angle of 90 degrees. This is the same thing as what we've been saying earlier. All right, so case number one is if you're trying to find the angle between two vectors. The dot product is a very useful way to figure that out. Another case, more appropriate for mechanics, is a lot of times you want to find uh, the component of a vector parallel, that's what that means, to a line, some arbitrary line that you've defined. Um, and that is much, much more easily explained if we have an actual picture. We'll do a tiny little picture of what you might see in terms of a problem. What if I have two pieces of wood here? Here's one piece here, and here's some other beam or something here. So these are two pieces of wood, right? You can kind of little grains, little wood grains or something like that, okay? And then attached to this point right here, right at the intersection of these two things, I have a force vector, right, and some rope, let's say. In other words, you've got some guy standing here with a rope. He's pulling on it with some force F, some number of newtons, okay? Um, well, what's happening is, obviously, the rope is physically connected to this intersection, to this point here, and I'm pulling on it. And because I'm pulling at an angle, and you know you're pulling down, some of this force is going to be uh, pulling in the down direction, giving kind of some force in this member. And then some of the force is horizontal and will be transmitted along this member. This is all kind of, you know, stuff that we've talked about many, many times before. So what you might do then, let me change colors to, I guess, green. 
What you might do then is you might want to figure out what is the amount of force transmitted along this member. So in green, I'll just kind of draw it here and terminate it there, and I might put this guy, and we might call this F sub A, because this beam might be called beam A, for instance. So the question might say, hey, you're pulling with 300 newtons down this way. How many newtons of force is uh, transmitted horizontally along beam A? So what you're basically doing here is you're trying to find the component of this force vector in this direction. Now, if you know the angle here, uh, you can calculate that because it's triangle trigonometry. We've done that, done that many times before. But you can also use the dot product. You know, a lot of times in engineering and science, um, it's useful to know different ways of doing things because depending on the problem you have, you may have to do it different ways. So if, obviously if you know the angle here, F cosine angle, cosine of the um, angle will give you this, the answer that we're seeking, F sub A. Um, but let's say you don't have the angle here. Okay, how could you figure that out? Well, it turns out that F A is also equal to the F vector, this vector here, dotted with a unit vector in the A direction. So this is the A direction, this horizontal direction on the, along this member. This defines a direction, a unit vector we can find in this direction. And we, if we know the force vector angled down like this, if we dot it with a unit vector here, then what we're doing is we're kind of chopping and getting the component in the direction that we seek, right? Why does this work? So first of all, let me circle this. And let me label a few things before we get into how, how it works. So this is the force on the rope. And this is the unit vector in a direction, which in this case is along the wooden direction. So what I'm saying is we can take the force vector dotted with a unit vector in that direction. That immediately gives you the component of the force in that direction. Why is that the case? Because if you look at the dot product, what this basically means is it's the magnitude of F, right? The dot definition of the dot product, magnitude of this vector times the magnitude of this vector unit vector in the a direction, time to find the magnitude of that, times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay. Now in this case, because we're dotting with a unit vector, this is just 1. So what you end up getting is f, the magnitude of f, times cosine of theta, which is what I already taught you, uh, told you a minute ago. If we knew what theta was between here, and I knew what the magnitude of f was here, like I pull with 35 newtons or something like that, I could take the 35 newtons times the cosine of the angle with triangle trigonometry is going to give me the component of the force in that direction. But sometimes I may not have the angle. Sometimes I may not even have the magnitude f. I may be given f as a Cartesian vector, x and y, um, and I may have some other information, and so in some problems you just have to trust for me for now that it's very useful instead of trying to figure out the angles here and dot them and all that stuff, it's, uh, or uh, trying to use triangle trigonometry, um, it's easier sometimes to take the vector form and dot it with a unit vector in whatever direction I care about to figure out what the component is in that direction. The best example I can come with when you might actually do this instead of just using triangle trigonometry is if you have a three-dimensional problem. You see, in two dimensions, it's very simple. If I know what angle this is, F cosine this is going to give me this. But what if it's a three-dimensional problem? It's much harder to visualize. If I have a force vector in three dimensions, and I'm trying to figure out what is the component of this force along this direction here, um, it's difficult with triangle trigonometry, especially when you're drawing it in three dimensions. So what is this angle between here? How do I figure that out? But I may know what my force vector is I, in IJK form, Cartesian form, and I may be able to find out what a unit vector is along the direction I care about. And if I can find those two things in Cartesian form, then I can dot them in Cartesian form, and I'm going to get, that's going to give me the component of that force in the A direction. Okay. Notice that what this returns is just a number. These, this dot product just gives me a number back. So if I'm pulling with 35 newtons here, it's going to tell me and maybe I'm pulling with 10 newtons horizontally in that direction. So if you then wanted to express this component as an actual vector, then you would say the force in the A direction as a vector is just equal to the magnitude in that direction times the unit vector in that direction. Okay. And that's basically all I want to say in this lesson. It's kind of difficult to, to uh, totally internalize it until we get to a problem, so we'll do that very soon. But the bottom line is uh, there's two main things in this class, at least right now, that we're going to use a dot product for. The first one is if I want to find the angle between two vectors, 
and I'm, I may be able to find their dot product, because remember, there's two ways to find a dot product. One of them is AB cosine theta. The other one is the Cartesian form. The X components multiplied, the Y components multiplied, the Z components multiplied, and then you add them together. So you can find a dot product without knowing any angles if you have the Cartesian representation. So you may be able to calculate the top and the bottom, take the inverse cosine, that gives you the angle between them. Same thing here. If I want to know the uh, component of this force acting in the A direction, if I don't know the angle here, then maybe I know the force in terms of Cartesian IJK form. Maybe I can find this unit vector in terms of IJK form, and then I just dot them together. This has to be a unit vector, though. When I take a force, dot it with a unit vector, it gives me the component in that direction, and I've derived why that's the case. I've shown you that it reduces to F cosine theta for this case, but the generality of it applies to three-dimensional problems as well. So if I've got a force vector oriented like this, and we've done lots of problems with how to find force vectors, force along a line, right? And then I have some other direction over here that defines some direction. I want to know what is the component of that force in this direction. Well, then I just take F and I dot it with a unit vector in that direction. That gives me the component of the force, okay? Once you have the component, then you just stick that component in front of the unit vector, then you get the vector form uh, uh, in the A direction. All right, so that's all I want to talk about now. It's kind of a weird title. When do we use a dot product? They're used for lots of different things practically. Let's go on to the next lesson. Let's do a real problem, and you'll get the hang of when we might actually use it to solve problems in mechanics.